Um, let's step back a little bit. Can you tell me when, when did this take place and how cold it was? And just take me through it a little bit. It was January 8th of 2012. And it was 22 degrees that night. And um, when Daisy was left out in the front yard, unconscious, they, um, we know from the text messages that they dropped her at two o'clock in the morning and I found her at 10 till five. And you were wearing what? Um, I believe it was a pair of sweatpants and a t-shirt and I think a hoodie but I didn't have my shoes on for some reason. She didn't have a hoodie on. It was just the sweatpants and a t-shirt, no socks or shoes, and um, her hair was wet and it was frozen. How'd you even find her at five o'clock in the morning? I heard something in the yard, and, I, and it, you know, waking up at, at that time of morning and hearing something, I, I thought it was the dogs at first. It, I, and I, I don't even know exactly what it was if she had gotten close to the door or what the rustling around sound was but my youngest son Tristan was sleeping in the living room and he also heard it we both jumped up and ran out at the same time and and found her in the yard and we could tell that she had some frostbite on her feet from being out in the cold and so that was, initially, we didn't know what had happened. When was it that you, that you found out, that you figured out what happened before you were left in the front yard? Well, um, well go ahead. <laughs> it was about when we got to the hospital that I started putting two and two together and that I really started remembering some of the things that happened the night before. And you took her to the hospital because? Um, I had taken her in to, to put her in the tub to warm her up a little bit. And I could see by some of the marks on her body that I thought she had been sexually abused. And I asked her if she was hurting and she started to cry. And um, so I called, at that point I called 911 and, and we took her to the hospital and the doctor said that's what had happened on the exam. And we don't need to go into, mm -hmm. obviously, de de details, but in general, so memories kept, started flooding back, is that what happened? I really just started sobering up. I still had a very high alcohol level at that point in time, so it was really hard for me just to remember anything of what happened that night. Which blows me away, one drink is what the article said. How, was it just straight alcohol? Yes. Well, and we don't really know if there were drugs involved. She laid in the yard long enough that that invalidated those tests for date rape drugs. She only remembers drinking the two, one or two drinks, but her blood alcohol at between 9 and 10 in the morning was 0.145. So it must have been really high at 2 o'clock in the morning. Yeah, no kidding. Um, then bad things started happening to make matters worse. Well, well let's, let, let's start off. The, the sheriff did do a quick investigation, isn't that right? Right. And what did he say to you? Um, initially, we talked to the deputies and the captain, and they seemed good at first. They seemed like they were trying to, to gather all the information and get the evidence together. Um, later in the week is when things started to look like there were some red flags and it was turning the other direction and that they were against us. Did the sheriff have a good case? Did he tell you? Did, did, did you have police reports and things like that? Did they, yes. What did he say? Um, initially, he said this was going to be huge, that other girls had come forward, that he thought there may have been up to 10, other, 10 or 12 other girls that had been victimized as well, that these boys had done the same thing too, that the girls couldn't remember bits and pieces of it, and that it was so good that I had found Daisy and brought her in, and that this was going to help these other girls as well. That was what he was initially saying. 
and how how did that make you feel when you heard that? It made me pretty happy initially. Well, not happy, I would say, more hopeful initially because I thought something would be done about it and that it wouldn't happen again. And when did that change and what happened? Um, well, the, that Monday then, my sons call, texted me from school and said that the boys that had assaulted the girls were had videotaped it and they were showing the videotapes on their phones at school. So I called the sheriff and Sheriff White and asked, told him what was going on and he said he would go over and take care of it. And then a couple days later when I talked to him he said the video videos were all irretrievable, that they had lost them. But still I thought that the sheriff had a lot of evidence in this case. That's what we thought too. There, there was a lot of, I thought, a lot of physical evidence based on the medical report and the phones and even the, the boys' stories. You know, they all, they all in the police report admitted that she was unconscious and they had to carry her out of the house. When did you find out and how did you find out and how did you react when you found out that it's been two years, nothing's been done. No charges have been filed, nothing. Or have charges were filed and not? They were filed and everything except for the one misdemeanor was dropped within a couple weeks. Um, they never told us why. I even hired an attorney to, to write letters and try to find out why and, and to get answers and we never could get any answers. They wouldn't talk to us. Um, then in May 21st, we were supposed to do a deposition for the um, misdemeanor child endangerment charge. And um, we had a call from the, the rape advocate through the YWCA and she said that the prosecuting attorney was angry about the petition that Anda, Amanda Amon had put on the internet and that he was gonna punish us. And he was going to basically um, tear the girls apart to punish the moms for letting this petition happen. The prosecutor said that to you? Yes. And Robert the, Rice told the, the rape advocate that that's what he was gonna do. And then that's where things got bad at school, is it in, in the community? They had been bad two weeks after the assault when the initial charges were dropped. It had gotten really bad at that point with the, the social media and the threats on the internet and Twitter and um, you know plans to beat my sons up at school and tell me about what it was like it was really hard I felt like I had, had like the whole world against me just all these people were like gaining up on me on social media and I felt like I had a little group of friends and sometimes that's not enough. Without getting too graphic, what were some of the things that they were doing and saying and threatening and that sort of thing? They were saying that I would get buyer's remorse and karma did its job and they actually started a trending hashtag that said Jordan and Matt are free. And it got really popular so I saw that all over my Twitter. And did people say things to you at school? Did they? Yeah, one time I was going to one of my classes after going to the bathroom and one of the kids came out into the hallway and yelled liar, then ran back into his classroom. People in the community cause problems for you as well? There's a lot of really good people there and there are a lot of people that backed us but there was a handful that were really bad and um, during that time I also got fired from my job because my um, employer had been threatened but w again when the sheriff went to talk to her she denied it and wouldn't wouldn't talk about it small town new people mm -hmm. is that what it felt like to you that's yeah yeah it, Felt like betrayal. <laughs> um, and, the, and 
do you think because it, this kid was a football player, right? Right. He was a big football player, mm -hmm. and he was the son of a prominent former state representative. Mm -hmm. So, what do you believe led to there not being charges? I think that there's some families in that area that have a lot of power and the boys involved. Um, one of the boys who had all the recordings on his phone, their family owned the restaurant in town, the A&G restaurant in town. Um, the boy that said he had consensual sex with my daughter um, had the political connections and was a football player. They were both football players, but they were very good friends with my sons also. My son was a football player and they had been at my house a few nights before. I had made them chili in Rotel and they watched the playoffs on the big screen. And then a few days later, they did this to my daughter. And not just your daughter, but over the years, do you believe many others? Yes. Some girls came forward and told me, actually contacted me and I told them to talk to the sheriff. And it all just went away. So you had to leave mm -hmm. your house mysteriously? Yes. What, tell me about that. Um, that happened the end of April, and we had a call um, early in the morning on Sunday morning. I was asleep. My son, who is um, my second son, who's 18 now and a senior, um, came into my bedroom and woke me up and said that one of his friends that lived in the neighborhood that um, he had wrestled with on the same team had called him and said our house was on fire and and everyone was there, the police and the fire department, and, um, and I was really scared. I was terrified. I called the highway patrol first thing because I was really afraid for the sheriff to be involved with it. So. so what do you think that was about? And do you have any evidence at all? So far they say it's electrical. It was a three-year-old house. It was a spec home and a brand new housing addition, but they say it was electrical. They don't find electrical at the site of origin, but they also didn't find any accelerants or anything, so. How is all this affecting you, my dear? I really personally wanted to go back to Maryville after all this blew over because I really did miss all of my friends that I did have. I really miss the cheer squad. I felt like they were almost a family to me. And I really did miss my dance team. So it was really hard for me to move to Albany and then hear that the house burned down and things aren't okay and it never will be okay. Do you feel like your childhood has been robbed? Yeah. Tell me about that in, in your words. Well, personally, when my when I was nine, my father passed away, so that was the starting of my childhood kind of going away. But when we moved to Maryville, it was almost like I kind of got a fresh start and I had a second chance at my childhood. And then it just got blown away with that. And how difficult is it for you now? It's really difficult, but it's almost for the best, because if I wasn't as mature as I am today, then I would have a lot time, a lot harder of a time understanding everything. What do you hope happens here? I hope people see through all the small town stuff, that they really see the story for what it is and instead of everyone's opinions. Is there something that we should do you want him prosecuted? Is it, has it been past the statute of limitations for that? I don't believe so. I, and I guess I'm, I don't know all the legal, but yes, I'd like to see them have, I'd like to see some justice. I'd like them to investigate the other girls um, that came forward. I'd like to, I think Daisy's already been very inspirational to some girls her age who have been through this and even some women my age who have come forward and told me it happened to them and they never, you know, in college or high school and they never were able to come forward and do anything about it and, and what an inspiration she is. So, yes, I guess I'd like to see justice and, and also help some other people as well as ourselves. Would, would you like 
this young man prosecuted as well? I would. And why is that? I almost want him to know what it's like to have everything taken away for you, from you and just to feel how I felt for such a long time. Are you worried of what could happen if charges are not filed against him? I'm almost worried that he'll repetitively do it and the next time something happens that someone could actually get even more hurt and that he'll just get away with it. And me too, because, you know, I hope that it's not going to have to come to him letting one of these girls die before they take it seriously. I think they, there was no justice and I think they did a really bad thing by not having any justice at all. This whole town gang up on you guys too and, mm -hmm. and kick you out of the, uh, it, 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 not kick you out, but make you afraid to live in their town anymore. Mm -hmm. I mean, or, or what, I guess what words would, let me let you put it into your words instead of me trying to come up with the words. I was terrified for my children. I was, even when we were back in Albany and felt safer, but then the house burned down, I was honestly terrified for my children. I was almost relieved when they said maybe it was just electrical. I hate to think that they're that vindictive, but part of me is still afraid. Because you're coming for, I thought they never thought, I thought that, I bet they thought you were just gonna let this go. Mm-hmm. Since the, art, the, the article's in that newspaper, have you heard anything more? Well, I've heard many things of how police are gathering around houses in Maryville and how people who were involved with the case are deleting all of their social media and they're almost running for the hills. They know there's some of the hackers groups have pulled up some of the really awful things they were saying on Facebook and Twitter, you know, a year, year and a half ago. And I noticed today that they were pulling up a lot of those really awful old statements and, and able to bring them back, which amazes me. But yeah, I think it's good that those people have to face the things they were saying.